when I was playing her and we were running down those corridors, you know, for the, <laughs> literally to save our own lives. Um, it really helped to have those endless white corridors and that endless single stripe, you know, just going on and on and on. It felt very wonderfully claustrophobic in that way, yeah. I gotta say, Double Blind is awesome. Uh, I watched it earlier this morning and was just blown away. I didn't know what to expect. It just kept subverting my expectations. I loved it. What about it really sparked your initial initial interest to want to be a part of it? You know, I thought it was such a tight script. I'm really glad you enjoyed it. Uh, it's really fun for me to be doing this press stuff because I'm finally speaking to other people who've seen the film, you know? So I'm, I'm being super geeky with everyone. Like, what do you think? Who's your favorite? Oh my God. Um, yeah, it was a really tight script. And for a single location place, I just thought there was so much going on to keep keep the audience members interested, you know? And the characters were all specific and different from each other, a truly diverse group of characters, I felt. I love the underdog element to it. I love the the kind of carpenter-esque, um, you know, fuck the system. Uh, and, and I thought that Dr. Burke was a really fun character. So I then kind of looked at, at Ian Hunt Duffy's work before the director to see his other shorts and whatnot and spoke to a friend of mine who'd done a film with him. And it all just came back really positive. So I was like, yeah, let's do it. I love that. And I love that you mentioned Carpenter because that was one of the the feelings I had. It was him yeah. and it was Cube, uh, which is a little... Oh, yeah. Yeah, it, I love that movie. Yeah. It just took me back to that. I did another single location movie years ago, British indie, that was nominated for a BAFTA called Exam. Mm -hmm. And it's a really interesting film, actually. It's, it's one of Gemma Chan's first movies, which is kind of interesting in itself. Um, but it's Colin Salmon as well. And it's all about an exam in it, for a job interview in which there is only one question uh, to answer. Mm -hmm. and if you if you screw up you get thrown out of the exam and it's kind of that people turning on each other's stuff um but often people compared it to cube so you might be you might be one for exam as well you know it's been on my watch list for a while i actually forgot oh, that cool gimma chan was in it so i'm gonna have to look at that uh because it, it, yeah. it seems like a really cool concept so you talk about the single location i mean how how much did you feel that helped with the atmosphere of you getting into that character and being in that tense environment? Well, I was very lucky in that, you know, I didn't have to go through what the wonderful cast playing the subjects had to go through with this awful kind of, if you sleep, you die. You know, well, first of all, what a great hook. I should have mentioned that. I mean, that's, you know, the script is, is superb in that regard as well, of course. Um, and so I didn't have to sort of suffer the way, you know, an actor suffers when they're, they're properly going into that headspace. Um, and it was a very communal vibe on the film set. So we had our lunch in that building. We had makeup done in that building. We had the production office in there. So, and you know, there was a door. Don't tell anyone, but it's not real. There was a door. <laughs> and we could go outside and enjoy the sun, you know? But I think when you're, when you're in the role, when you're playing, you know, when I was playing her and we were running down those corridors, you know, for the... <laughs> <laughs> literally to save our own lives. Um, it really helped to have those endless white corridors and that endless single stripe, you know, just going on and on and on. It felt very wonderfully claustrophobic in that way. Yeah. It feels both claustrophobic and hypnotic in a way. It's yeah. so, it's so intriguing. And the, uh, yeah, I think the way he's handled, I mean, the whole crew, you know, from the writer to the director, to the production designer and the cinematographer, and then of course everything else combined as well. But, but, the way in which that set is handled and the way in which the dreamscape elements come in, I just think it's masterful, you know? Absolutely. And of course, Dee Hexton's music adds to that extraordinary sense of, of calamity and, um, and uh, internment, you know? Mm -hmm. The music reminded me a lot of The Shinings in a way, in that yeah. haunting sort of ambient noise. I loved it. Uh, oh, that's cool. I love Dr. Burke in that, for a lot of people who know your work of recent, you know, they're used to Jadis on The Walking Dead and the, her villainous kind of streak. But with Dr. Yeah. Burke, it, it feels so different from typical sci-fi doc, jo, doctor genre where they're evil. She feels compassionate. What was it like, you know, trying to find that thread for her in comparison to some of your prior works? Yeah, I think, you know, I approach every character 
in a similar way as in, you know, I don't want to go on about actually stuff because I think it's, I think it's either a bit wanky for people who don't do it. And I think a bit, sometimes it takes away the magic of the experience when you're watching stuff, you know, but with her, I think, you know, okay, I'll say this when you're playing kind of bad guy, quote unquote, you obviously don't want to be judgmental of your character and you want to live through their experience of things. And sometimes when, sometimes when those bad guys, quote unquote, know that they're doing something awful, it's a really hard thing to carry around. With Dr. Burke, she had such a, a kind of, she, she, she feels things and you can hopefully see that, but she, and she has concern, but she's got such an armory around her that I think has served her in, you know, coming up the ranks as a woman, um, you know, as a, in, in the position she's gotten to, I think it served her, but it, 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 it's not the kind of person I want to be, you know what I mean? Um, but that sort of protective field that she has about what she's doing and how complicit she is, at least allowed me as an actor to A, not judge her and B, to be able to escape her when I needed to. You know? That makes sense? Yes, it does. And that sounds like a really good way to to get into that headspace for her because she yeah. is a very complex character. Did you and the director talk at all about her further, like what her backstory might have actually been, given how sort of ambiguous it kind of leaves everything? You know, that's a really good question. We didn't. And generally speaking, I would be going there with the director, um, with the writer, hopefully. But it felt really clear to me. I think the script is just really well written and it felt really clear to me what my role was. And it, and um, yeah, we had a little bit of rehearsal, which was really nice because that's not so common anymore. Um, and that was fun because you get to see how the director plays as well, you know, and he's quite specific about what he wanted, but we, we still played around with stuff. Like I was maybe going to do Dr. Burke with a Scottish accent, for instance, because she's Burke, you know, and she's, mm -hmm. I mean, Burke, I think is an Irish name, but I, when I think of Burke and Burke, I think of Burke and Hare, which is all set in Scotland, you know, and I am Scottish and, and why not? But we ended up with this sort of my sort of, as I call it, like my, my headmistress voice, you know, <laughs> more than just acting. I mean, it fits, it fits. It fits the, the, the mystery nature of her. So it, it worked. Uh, um, yeah. I didn't want to mustache twirl too much, but, but I think it, <laughs> hopefully it turned out well. <laughs> it did. It did. And so actually speaking of the, the, the head mistress nature of her, I really like her look. I mean, it's such a <laughs> very striking appearance, whether it's, you know, the hair, the way she presents herself. How did you go about working with the costume and the makeup and everything to really hone in on that look? Our wardrobe designer was so great. And um, I really enjoyed our fittings because she, she had her down, man. She had it down. And there was varying degrees of that sort of slightly wipeable fabrics, you know, um, sort of clean the uh, clean the dirt off yourself, get the blood off yourself, go home to your nice life, you know. Um, and I loved that she wasn't stylish. She wasn't fabulous in any way. She wasn't, again, that sort of uh, moustache twirling villain. We need to come up with a term for women that isn't moustache twirling. Not that we don't occasionally have a bit of a tash, but you know what I mean? That sort mm -hmm. of evil queen thing, you know, she didn't, she wasn't like, she wasn't sexy in any way. Right. Um, so yeah, it was really down to the wardrobe designer. She was fantastic and our team were lovely as well. And the shoes, I mean, the shoes are like my absolute gross bugbear of those kinds of shoes. So it really worked really, really well. Um, and the, yeah, and hair and makeup were amazing. I actually used um, Roisin condom from makeup on a short film I made recently here called Quicksand, an Irish film that I just uh, directed and played a role in. Um, and she's fantastic. And then Madonna Bambino, isn't that the best name in the world? Madonna yeah. Bambino is our head of department in makeup. And you can see how adept she is with, um, with blood and gore. And that's a real pleasure to work with as well. So yeah, they were very collaborative, but I really, it, it really was down to them, you know, all, all of her look. It just, it, it just happened that that everybody doing their job on this was doing it very, very well. Well, and that's what you love about an indie production is just everybody yeah. comes in wanting to make the best thing possible. So that's that's yes. awesome that you got to have that. Um, yeah. So you mentioned the blood and gore. I did want to go into a few spoilery questions, so I'll have a spoiler warning in the article. But oh, I mean, no. I thought you weren't allowed to do any spoilers at all. Oh, am I not? Okay, I can avoid it. If that's what I'd be told by by 
some other journalist that I was saying, I take it you've been told not to, to break spoilers. And they said, yes, we've been told not to break spoilers. Okay. Well, um, I, I shall not break spoilers. Uh, sorry. No, it's all good. I, you know, part of me actually doesn't want to get into spoilers, but it's, you know, but, nature of the job. Um, yeah. So when did you, I mean, you had a, a shorter shoot, I'm sure with your smaller role, but when did you get to see the final product for this movie? Oh, that's a good question. Cause I, I was sneaky. <laughs> I can't remember why, but I asked, oh, I had some ADR to do. Um, so I had some additional dialogue recording to do on it. And I said, I'd really like to see the film to make sure that when I'm doing you know, the ADR, I know the whole vibe of it so that I can make sure it all works really well. And someone I don't remember who was like, I'm not supposed to send this to you. And they did. So I got to see it quite early on before all the special effects were finished on it. So that wonderful scene where Millie Brady's character is sort of flying up into the air, you know, um, and that's not a spoiler and it's not a sci-fi, but it's part of the dreamscape of the film. Mm -hmm. um, and so I got to see some of that before the ropes had been taken out. And it was such a delight to see Millie do that movement. I thought she was absolutely fantastic. Um, so, yeah, it was... It was around ADR time when they were almost, you know, finished with it. And I was thrilled, thrilled to see it. That's amazing. I, thought, I, I knew watching the monitor during the making of that, they were making something really special. And I was not disappointed when I watched it. And then seeing it in the cinema in Galway at the Galway Film Flower, which is a big Irish film festival, it was really cool to see it with an audience because then you felt that it wasn't just me. You know, it's hard to be objective when you've been in something, of course, entirely objective. Um, so it was great watching it with an audience because they were just like, oh, 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 oh yes. It's a pretty visceral movie. I mean, when uh, the the first character dies, I was, I, even I was like, whoa, that's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. but it also establishes the stakes for the rest of the movie. So, it's, yep, yep. And you really care about her. Like, I think she's mm -hmm. probably the most lovable character in the whole thing, you know. Um. <laughs> She played it so well, Abby. I'd seen her in The Cellar. I'd actually been at the Cellar premiere uh, of an Irish film called The Cellar, which is worth a watch. It's a horror. Um, and Abby had played an American young woman in it, and she was brilliant. And so when I got to, when I saw that she was attached, I was really thrilled. And then when I got to meet her um, at first, I was like, you're so brilliant in The Cellar. She was like, what? And I'm like, you're Irish? This is crazy. So yeah, I thought she did a wonderful job of um, making us fall in love with her and then where you go <laughs> there you go unfortunately but uh yeah. yeah she she played it so well um what what did you what was one of the big scenes that really surprised you how well it played on on the big screen when you saw it in theaters because i mean i i'm still blown away by the demonic thing that we see in the dreamscape mm -hmm. but what what was the one that really got you the most i think it was oh yeah i can feel it now i think it was it was millie's character in the dark and her starting to hear her mother's voice. Mm -hmm. And it felt really disorienting and really scary. And I think we've all experienced that. No matter how brave or big we are, you know, we've been in a very, very dark room. We don't know which way is up. And it's just a wee bit scary. And I thought that did that so well. But you have, of course, the added high stakes of what else is going on. Um, I love that arc with her and her feelings about her mom, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, that scene, it just, it's just use of light and music and sound and great acting and, and well, it's great everything, but it's kind of really simple and really effective. And I just, I didn't think that piece of it was going to be as exciting to watch as it was. We've talked about double blind a bit. I did want to ask you a little bit about walking dead, uh, because mm -hmm. I, d I have loved Jadis's arc throughout this whole show. Um, Thank you. I'm excited that you're coming back for the ones who live and mm. I'm curious, you know, what can you tell me about how much she's transformed since the last time we saw her on the mainline yeah. show and her story coming up in the new one? There's very little I can tell you because The Walking Dead is such a wonderful show to watch because everyone has different opinions of what's going to happen, even when it happens, different interpretations. And I think that's one of the pleasures for the fans. So we like to keep as many secrets as possible. Um, but if you haven't seen me in, if you haven't seen Jadis in The World Beyond, you might you might not know where she's going in this. And I can certainly say that from from the world beyond, you see that she's um, quite high up in the Civic Republic military. She's very committed to the cause of the CR and the CRM. And she truly believes that 
they are the last light of the world and the work they're doing is going to save humanity, uh, which is why I suggested that ridiculous um, Joan of Arc haircut for for the world beyond. But I didn't really think about the fact that, you know, a year or so later, I'd have to bloody get it again for this show. <laughs> so I haven't been able to grow my hair for like three years or something at this point. Um. So, yeah, so she, you know, she, Jadis has always been a bit of a chameleon and, and an ever evolving creature. Like I hope we all are. Um, and she, she has found her place in this, in this other realm, you know, and she feels very strongly about her commitment to it. I'll say that. I really can't wait to see what comes of that then. Yeah, um, because I can't wait to see it too, man. I'm so excited. I, I was, I was supposed to be at the premiere next week, but I have to be away on another show. So I'm feeling a little bit sad that I'm not going to get to see my peeps, you know, if I'm honest, my, my wee Walking Dead family, you know. So uh, I shouldn't say that on an interview on, on the video. There's always a hope and a chance that it could still happen, but it doesn't look likely at the moment with the schedule we've got on what I'm working on. Um, so, yeah, I got a beautiful message from Andy the other day saying lovely things. So. That was very nice to hear from him, and uh, and we'll we'll see each other again. I just want to be there to celebrate, you know. Absolutely. This show's been a long time coming. Four and a half years we've been waiting for people to see this thing since you know Jadis and Rick went off in the helicopter, and um, I'm so excited to see Michonne on the screen and kicking ass because she does it better than anyone, you know. She really does. So half the time I watch the show, I go, she could just take out the apocalypse <laughs> yeah. herself. <laughs> Give. Give no, no enough. pressure, Joe. No pressure. Yeah, yeah. right. Give her enough time and, and a couple swords, and she'll she'll get it done. <laughs> yeah. But I'm excited to see. Uh, yeah, I when the movie was first announced, and then it became the show. I was still the whole time. I was like, "Do it, do it, bring back uh, Rick and Jadis. Yeah. I want to see their story." Um, Bless you. So uh, we have you coming back in the ones who live. Obviously, we don't. I don't know what happens in that show, but do you think there is a, a future for Jadis beyond that show? I mean, whether it be a world beyond se another season of world beyond or yeah. her own story. I'm told very much that the world beyond, you know, is, is done and completed. Um, but with the walking dead universe, you never know, because I think they've been really, you know, Scott's been really inventive in, in, in the creations that have come since the flagship ended. And, I just, you just never know, you know, you just never know. We could, we could have all sorts of fun. I could be, uh, I could make myself a Zimmer frame from the old uh, bits of the junkyard, you know, and just keep going. <laughs> that would be exciting to see. I mean, there's like, like you say, Scott's just done such a great job of expanding that universe. There's so many directions yeah. for Jadis to go. Yeah. Uh, unless, I mean, and I know you can't tell me unless she dies in the ones who live, but fingers crossed that doesn't happen because I want to see more of her. Yeah. It's called uh, the ones who live after all. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, before I let you go, uh, you mentioned that you just got to direct a, a short film, and I've been a big fan of your work behind the camera as well on the the Thank woman you. trilogy and everything. And so I'm curious, you know, what what is it looking like for you possibly stepping back into the director's chair on a full feature? Thank you. Yeah, I actually have a feature coming up shooting in Ireland called Bride Squad. It's not. Uh, it's a big departure from Darling my first feature, but it's uh, very much where I'm at home as well. It's a comedy and it's uh, three women on a road trip. Um, one of whom has been left at the altar by her fella and uh, they're on a mission and it's really fun. And it's all to be shot around Ireland and in Galway and it's just going to be beautiful. And we've got a really, we're casting at the moment actually, but we've already got um, Mary Elizabeth Ellis attached and she's wonderful and I adore her as a person we did Lodge 49 together mm -hmm. um and I've always admired her talent I was totally nerding out on her when she when I saw that we got to work together on Lodge 49 um so yeah it's going to be a comedy and and it's going to be a lot of fun and then Quicksand the one that I made here um last year uh that's doing the festival circuit at the moment it's a 22 minute short right now and it's done it's done quite a few festivals we've won the best cinematography at Loud here we opened at Galway which is great uh, it's had a great response, but I'm thinking I might cut it into a feature. I think there's something there that I might mess with it while I'm away on this job and cut it into a feature. So that's my plan. Uh, so that more people can see it. That would be exciting. And it's, I mean, about, it's about a, it's about a, a woman who is, is in love, wanting a family, but is also a sex addict. And, uh, 
it's quite dark, but it's also wet in there. And I didn't write this one. It was Siobhan Callahan who also plays the lead. And she's an actor that was on Vikings Valhalla with me. And she's so talented. And she showed me the script she'd written. I was like, well, this should be made. So we made it. That's yeah. awesome. I mean, that's that's such a great way to collaborate with people is, is uh, especially actors. I feel like so many actors, you know, they they see so many scripts that they start to pick up ways to tell their stories themselves. So yeah. I just love that yourself and and her and others have gotten a chance to do that. So I'm, uh, yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to keep my eyes out for more updates Thank on, you. on quicksand as well as uh, you said, bride smash. Is that what it was? Bride squad, but I like bride, bride squad. smash. <laughs> <laughs> bride squad. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe it's based bride... on an art book by uh, Lisa Carey and, uh, Caroline Grace Cassidy and it was a really successful book so they they wrote the script and I've had a wee pass on it and you know uh that's fun as well that that collaboration piece but it's their story and I'll be directing and we'll have a lot of fun that's awesome well maybe then you talk to them you get the sequel to be Bride Smash how's that okay great (laughs) (laughs) chill there we go well uh regardless of what the the rest of the future holds. I really do look forward to putting the word out about double blind. It is like I, like I've been saying this whole interview, it's so awesome. I can't, I mean, people are going to have their minds blown. They're going to have questions. So I can't wait for them to see it. 